with your host, Nat Strong and Allie. Welcome back, guys, to episode 86. 86. That's wow. wow. I know. Wow. I can't believe it. We're really, we're really doing it big. We're doing it so big. Yes. So larger than I thought it would ever become. Right. We started with episode one. Yeah. Now look at us. And we actually have more than 86 episodes. We really do. we also do. have listener stories. We have nine listener stories to be exact. And we have a bonus episode at the end of every season. You know what I am still thinking about? Those possum hands that we got. Last episode. Yeah. yeah I need more information. <laughs> um, If you are the person who sent us the possum hands, I'm still very curious yeah. about how you sourced those possum hands. Also, what am I supposed to do with that? Because Alyssa not doesn't keep things at her house because she claims she doesn't have space. But I think it's because she doesn't want possum hands. No, no, in her no. House. If you have seen my house, there is I ha- I have so much shit because uh-huh. I am a pack rat. I oh. like should be on the show hoarders. Really? But if I bring home, I'm trying to get better. So if I bring home one more thing, it's just like indulging my mental right. illness. So I need. Should, I need to like do a clean out. Yeah, should we do like a cleaning Alyssa's house vlog? It would. You don't want to see it. <laughs> you don't want to see. It. Is there like dead cats? No, no, no. I don't have like food trash or anything right. like that. It's mo. It's like knickknacks. Oh, I could see that. Yes. Yeah. Every time we go travel somewhere, Alyssa's like hitting those souvenir shops oh, hard. Yes. <laughs> I have like I have a shot glass collection that. Nobody needs a shot glass collection. Like the older I get, I'm like, I don't even drink that much, but it's just easy. Like you go somewhere and you're like, oh, I can fit this in my carry on. You know what I mean? So I've just acquired like hundreds of shot glasses. Maybe it's time to start gifting those. It it really is. We should do some giveaways. (laughs) Comment below if you would be interested in (laughs) Alyssa's trash knickknack giveaway. Yes. I have a lot of things that like I have miniature things, you know right, what I like mean? Like little figurines yes. that say like, you know, Holland or like Valentine's Day right. 2008. Yeah. Okay. Which is like a day I never want to remember ever again. But for some reason I can't throw it out. And it's not because of like, oh, I don't want to throw this out because yeah. like this reminds me of this person. It's just like literally I don't like to throw things out. Right. So see, I have this is so this is why we're really good friends because nay I say best friends yes because sometimes I get frustrated looking at all of the things in my life and I throw everything you away. do Natalia's notorious yeah. for just she'll receive something feels no emotional attachment <laughs> to it and just throws it in a dumpster <laughs> And I need some of that to rub off on me because I have cards from like my graduation two well, years ago and I can't throw it out. But then I feel bad because I'm like, pe- like I meet someone and they're like, oh, yeah, we hung out like several times. And I'm just like, oh, I like mentally took you and as threw a you in the and trash threw it. Like, I think it comes from just trauma of like not wanting to be attached to anyone or right. anything. I think they're both trauma responses. <laughs> I think like one way to deal with trauma is to be like nothing has any importance right. starting a clean slate every yes. day. And another way is to be like this one little thing holds right. some like inkling of a meat. Like I am attached to this yeah. item. If I throw it out, I throw out a piece of myself. Like right. neither of these things are healthy. We need like, to. Like this trinket is representative of me. Yes. And like when I look around, I see all that I am and oh. I'm reminded that I'm real and I exist. Exactly. And these are my hobbies and these are my interests. And that is super important. And because sometimes I look around and I'm like, who the fuck am I? Right. I'm like, reinventing myself constantly. every day. Yeah. Different hair, different outfits, different makeup, like different locations. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. it's disorienting where you, I feel like, are very grounded because of that. Yes, but I, I think I have too much shit regardless. <laughs> so we need, here's what we're going to do. We're going to find like some mad scientist that uh, can extract the essence of Natalia and the essence of Alyssa, mash them together right. And so either create a third being. I'm not really sure where I'm going with this. Right. Or somehow, like, inject me to care a little bit less about oh. things and inject you to care a little bit more about to objects. Balance. To balance. To balance. Okay, yeah. right. Oh, my God. I just had a great idea. Okay, if someone can, can like, make a morph of Alyssa and I, you know how, like, you take two celebrities' That would be so haunted. And put it together to oh see what their my children God. would look like. Oh, my God. Yes. What would our children look like? Yes. Please do so. Um, if you combined both of our eggs in a Petri dish and make... <laughs> mashed them together you know and i i you heard get a ningen. yeah you get a ningen. that's right I was an gonna, abomination yes yes also 
you guys, um, next episode is officially our spooky season October episode. That's true. So I we forgot. are going to be in costume. Oh, no. Every episode. Why do I agree to these things without considering I'm so the amount excited. of work that goes into it? I'm so excited. That is exciting. Yes. Yeah. And you guys need to dress up in costume to listen, too. Yes. Send pictures of you in costume watching yeah. us in costume. Right. And then <laughs> and then maybe I'm we'll. Just picturing a psychopath. <laughs> Like the guy, like from Saw, like the little yeah. puppet, the puppet with the things on his cheeks, and he's Somebody like riding a that. tricycle. Okay, wh- this is a sick fucking costume. Once I went to a Halloween party, and there was a girl dressed as the Saw on a tricycle, and she just she rode the a, tricycle yes, around. She had a oh, suit that, on, that her face sick. painted white with like the swirls yes. on her cheeks, and she had a tricycle around, and she was riding it, and it was fucking. That is amazing. Nailed it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. I also I love that because if you get really fucking drunk at a halloween party Mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to walk but if you've got your trike you know you've got those two balance wheels on the side holding you up no matter what you're doing you can just scoot i know she was honestly having so much fun that i was dressed as rainbow dash the um the my little pony oh cute. that one i remember oh, I yeah love that. i had like a big rainbow wig and like a big tail and i was on my period so i had taken my doll which has caffeine in it and then i'd also oh, so you drank, were amped so i was fucking crunk as fuck yes i remember i woke up the next day and i was like still drunk and like went to ihop with my grandma and my aunt and i was like still feeling it and i was like like did you have like remnants of your of your makeup from the night before on yeah definitely and I thought it like still looked good so I didn't need to mess it I was thinking (laughs) about that I used to do that in college all the time where like if I got if I went out to a party got way too drunk fell asleep with my makeup on I would wake up the next morning look in the mirror and be like good enough and I just like (laughs) go about my life I know like better than it would be without it (laughs) right right? like my mascara and my eyelashes are like have like you know, uh, molded together to right. like still like outline three my sticks. wall. Yeah, yeah, but like it still outlines my eye. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah. it's good enough. Exactly. I know the the bar was so low. It was, it was so a low. Time I also think about. I just I went to so many frat parties in sweatpants and slippers right. and and wife beaters, and I look back hey. and like wet hair. Oh, hey, you're describing my favorite kind of outfit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I would, and I thought I looked fucking good. And I look back and I'm like, was that, that was just like bottom of the bear. Like that mm. was what I thought was putting in effort. And those frat boys ate it up. They well, were like, this girl's so cool. They probably thought, wow, this girl's so low maintenance. Little do they know. <laughs> I'm actually extremely high maintenance. I just give off the vibe of being a trash person. Right. So yeah, I mean, that's, they're, whew. Yeah, that, you know, that was a time. And I still have so many things from college so that I should memories. throw out. And so I haven't done it. See, yeah. I've thrown all of them out, except for I've talked about the Jumanji box that's in yes. my garage that has things in there that I don't want to get it open. I yeah, don't, don't open it. Too many painful memories. So painful. And yeah. so many like old cell phones and stuff in there. Yes, I do need to throw out my old cell phones. But I'm always paranoid. Like, if I throw this out, is someone going to find it and like be able, even though it's like crushed, you know right. what I mean? Like a car ran so, over it. So like get it. your nudes. Yeah. I think about that and then I'm like, literally no one fucking cares about my nudes. But what if, what if the one person that finds well, it? Well, you have like a like a job where having, you know, scandalous things happen to you would probably like affect you in a poor way. Like right. being HR, you're supposed to be like yeah. not a human. Oh, just this like podcast a robot. affects me in a <laughs> <Yeah>. negative way. <laughs> so, but I feel like that it wouldn't affect, you know, it might even help me. I've said yeah. that before. Yeah, I that's think it true. would help me. Yeah, you never know. You know, any publicity can be good publicity. Any publicity is good publicity. And I do, before I forget, want to point out, you guys, yes. last episode I said I was going to be wearing the Let's Get Haunted shirt. Yeah. And I am doing it. You this just is got to up the way I do. I know it. I'm trying to like not knock over you all of these things. You guys liked my stand up cam. You're getting stand up cam Woo! too. Wow, wow, it's a haunted girl summer. Haunted, haunted, and haunted Alyssa's wearing everything. size. This one is a size small. small. It is. Uh, keep in mind these are unisex sizes. I do also it's own long. a size medium. Yes. So I fit into smaller medium. It kind of just depends on how tight I want my shirt that day. I, in right. general, I prefer the size medium. Um, I will say I'm a little bit taller than five foot seven. If mm-hmm. you're wondering, like, how long is that? So it is pretty long. It is long. Um, and I weigh. I mean, I fluctuate so hard with my weight. I would say anywhere between one twenty and one forty, which I know is like a big. <laughs> I don't like, think so. I fluctuate. Every year, like throughout yeah. the year, I can weigh up to it's 140 a, or as healthy. low as 120. 
Think about how healthy that is. Your body's just responding yeah, to the stimuli. Yeah, very that's true. Quickly, hey, that's one right? way to look at it. Yeah. 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 Right? Like if there was a huge blizzard or like an ice that's storm and true. your body did nothing. It's then... like, hey, we're going to store all your calories right. to like help you get through this moment. Or if you're really stressed and you're, if your body didn't store calories and stuff, then like I feel like you would just, you know, not make it. That's like true. Your ancestors wouldn't have made it. That's true. You know, wow. If, I feel so much better about my like fluctuating weight no matter yeah. what I do. It's like I could be working out all the time right. and weigh a certain amount and then I could be dieting and it would just like do the opposite of what it's supposed yeah, to do. Yeah. It's I everyone's body is different, but yes. I personally found for me and I worked as a Pilates instructor for many, many years. So I worked with people who were, you know, like working with uh, injuries. And I also worked with people who were trying to lose weight. And I consistently saw with clients and with myself, when you're stressed out, it doesn't matter what you're eating. doesn't matter what you're doing in the gym. Your body is going to store calories because your body is like, I'm stressed. Is there a tiger coming after me? Do I have to right. live in this stone tree while there's monsters yeah. <laughs> outside for 50 years? Right. Like, it's going to store. So I feel, and that's the hardest thing. I wish it was just work out and eat well. Then we'd all like. Then we'd all be fine. Be yeah. Fine. yeah. But it's but so much more complicated. Stress. And medication plays a huge part in it. Yeah. Like antidepressants, you gain it's weight. A stress on your body as yeah. well. Ste yeah. um, steroids, and I'm not talking about anabolic steroids. I mean like steroids for people with chronic illness. Like those yeah. make you gain weight. And it, you get moon face and your face looks... Mm -hmm so much larger than the rest of your body. I've had that happen to me before. Right. Um, you know, immunosuppressants, you lose weight no matter what you're doing. Yeah. So I know it's, it's crazy. It is it's, crazy. There's so many different factors and you just really never know. I know my brother, my brother's diabetic. So he used to take insulin shots and he's always like storing fat where the actual needle is going mm. in because that's how reactive your body is. It's like, Oh, I'm going to constantly get picked right. or pricked in this spot. I'm going to start building up a fat pad. The right human there. body is it's crazy. Amazing. Yeah. Crazy. And that's why we really try to reframe our mindset right into appreciating even though i no one hates their body more than me but that's <laughs> why i try we to gotta reframe. keep reminding yes, yes right everybody is beautiful and that is also why for our sweatshirts we carried such a large range we went from extra small to 5xl yep. because fuck i totally understand your body can switch at a moment's notice and also everyone has different preferences like yeah i you know sometimes get a tank top that's not necessarily my size because i just feel like i want a bigger size that looks right. better on me or like whatever like the the feel the vibe that i'm going for like sometimes i want to wear like a tiny shirt for a baby like i yeah, am today yes. other it times i want to be love it. like a big tent like you know yes. just like adam sandler core yes absolutely <laughs> and hopefully by the time this episode comes out we will have um 3XL and 4XL, right. but like we've been saying in episodes past, um, there is a garment shortage. We're really trying to get um, those sizes out on yep. the website. It actually took a very long time to find extra small, believe yeah. it or not. And so some people who are on like super tiny listeners mm -hmm. were like, hey, where's my size? And it's like, we were like, can you say that louder? I can't yeah, hear Yeah, sorry. You. You're, you're just so, so small. small. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we finally got extra small up for our, our um, listeners that right. were looking for that size. We finally got 2XL up of the Haunted Girl Summer design for our listeners that were looking for that size. And we continue to search for 3, 4, and 5. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully we can put out some new merch for the winter time, perhaps. Yeah. Hopefully um, one day we make a shirt that's big enough to encase the whole world and stop global warming. What, Natalia? Wow. So beautiful. Thank you. Love that sentiment. <laughs> Thank you. Are you ready to tell me your story I today? I am. And my story for today, I did not write an intro for it because That's I forgot fine. to. So I'm going to go off on the fly wow. on this intro. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. My, right? When I try to go off on the fly, it's disaster. But I feel like for you, it'll be good. We'll see. I, I'm. I will, we'll find out. <clears throat> Alyssa. Yes. That's my name. <laughs> That's the full I froze. Version. I was trying to think of what to say next, but I froze. Oh, you my could, God. What if you asked me a question? Okay. Alyssa, yeah. have you heard of fairy tales? I have. You know what? I have. Let me tell you what I've heard about fairy tales. Yes, please. Um, I took a class in summer school when I was in college. I just needed to fill some, some requirement. Right. And it was a class on fairy tales oh I love that class and I wrote my final project on fairy tales in pornography oh what because there's so many fetishes surrounding like Little Red Riding Hood the big bad wolf right. like taking these very innocent fairy tales right. and creating something lewd from them right so I did and the 
paper I wrote wasn't taking a position of whether something is good or not. Yeah. I think it's totally fine to do whatever the fuck you want. Right. But <laughs> um, it was more of just like, this is a phenomenon that happens. Why does it happen? Is it because, and this is what my paper was about, is it because the original fairy tales, like the Grimm's fairy tales, yeah. always were very fucking brutal. Right. They were like, then he chopped his... Uh-huh. leg off and like the the grandma got fucking swallowed and never came back and right. then as americans coming from like a very quaker puritanical mm-hmm. um point of view took those brutal fairy tales and dumbed them down to be like and then they sliced open the wolf's belly and grandma was fine right. you know what i mean so now we're kind of, because we didn't have the chance to like feel all of those like raw brutal violent emotions mm-hmm. as children because we had these dumbed down versions now we have to create like right something, something to fulfill fu- that to animalistic fulfill that. need that's exactly within all humans right especially men mm-hmm. and was i right or was i wrong who knows but that's what my yeah. paper was i just needed the credits <laughs> <laughs> i understand that yes. yeah so my story that i'm going to tell you today yes is a story of stories or dare i say a tale of tales oh my and if one were to flip a coin heads or tails they might find <laughs> that their head is thinking of tales <laughs> And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Okay. And ta- fairy tales run the gamut from uh, folklore that talks about trees who can speak to you and sorcerers that see the future and right. and very whimsical ideas of, of um, you know, rivers that flow forever and ideas that are very abstract that not might not necessarily mean something real, right? Like okay. we think of like Peter Rabbit is like this little rabbit that runs away from home and he gets into mischief. Now he's wearing like a little jacket and socks and stuff. Now, do we really think that's about a little rabbit that was wearing a jacket and socks and yes. goes and gets missing? On this podcast, we do. Yeah. And that is the end <laughs> of that paragraph. <laughs> so let's talk about arguably the most famous, in my opinion, okay, and dark of all of the fairy tale authors. And that is Hans Christian Andersen. Do you Ooh. know Do you know Hans Christian Andersen? I do. Allie? Yes. But the again, my exposure to fairy tales is the dumbed down Americanized right. versions. Mm-hmm. So I'm ready to hear about, you know, what the original brutal Lovely. versions are. Lovely. So Hans Christian Andersen, he is like a super famous um, author who wrote a bunch of fairy tales. And you might have even heard of some of them, like The Little Mermaid. Totally. The Emperor's New Clothes. Mm-hmm. The Nightingale. The Steadfast Tin Soldier. Mm-hmm. I don't fucking know that. I know that one. Really? I don't know The Nightingale. The, I'll tell you it. Okay. The Red Shoes. The Princess and the Pea. The Snow Queen. The Ugly Duckling. The Little Match Girl. And Thumbelina. Cute. Yeah. I love Thumbelina. Yeah, I do too. But you've never heard of him the way that we're going to talk about him today. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of Hans. You can go ahead and describe to our listeners what he looks like. He looks like a white man with some curly hair. He's Danish. He's Danish. Mm -hmm. He's wearing a very nice looking suit and Is that a bow tie or is that a tie? It's one of those like old timey, like 1800s things. (laughs) Where like a bow tie had a baby with a tie. Yeah. Got it. Yes. It's, he actually looks very distinguished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I enjoy this photo. It's also a profile photo. I think like everyone looks distinguished from the side. Yes. Right? Yes. If eyes are the windows to the soul and you can't see into someone's eyes, they look distinguished. I, I agree. Now, Hans was born in Odens in Denmark on the 2nd of April in 1805, Mm. and he was a Danish author, and he was this playwright, and he wrote travelogues, he wrote monologues, he wrote poems, he wrote fairy tales, he wrote everything he could get his hands on, um, but he's most remembered now for his fairy tales. He even wrote novels. He was just, like, legit a writer. And have you heard of his most famous tales of the ones that I that I was listening? Which do you think is the most famous to you? I'm going to say The Little Mermaid's the most famous because I know that there is a mermaid um, statue. Oh, I love that you brought up the yes. statue. Yes. So The Little Mermaid is the most famous, probably in my opinion, but it's because it was turned into a Disney movie in 1989 called The Little Mermaid. Yes. And there is um, commemorating Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid. There is a statue called The Little Mermaid that's in Denmark. And I have some photos of it here that I was going to talk about later, but I'll talk about it now since we brought it up. Yeah. Um, We're, you know what? Yeah. We're weirdly enough. It's like an object of like extreme vandalism all the time. Did you know that? No. So there's like, it's literally just this tiny, here's a photo of it. 
you can go ahead and describe that to people. It's very small. Like when I went to Denmark, because oh, yeah. I have family that lives there, if you remember from the last episode, they proudly brought me to this statue. And it's I was so like, tiny. <laughs> statue for ants <laughs> sorry in america <laughs> yeah. we have we defaced an entire mountain <laughs> to like chisel four dudes that apparently lived in the 1800s right yeah. Yeah. right right um okay so i wrote in denmark people love hans there are several streets squares statues plaques you can go to his childhood home like it feels like everything is like this bar hans christian anderson had a drink at in 1840 yeah. <laughs> or like this prostitute where died here where hans christian anderson was staring at her yes you know, like yeah people are like very they love hans and um but weirdly enough some of those statues themselves become infamous and i don't know if it's because they're so famous that like um just vandals decide to vandalize it just so that it uh like because people are going by it all the time but right. here's some photos of some vandalizing stuff that people have done so this oh. one says racist fish underneath it and that was during the height of the um I don't know what it was called in Denmark, but during the BLM protests okay. in 2020. Is it is the Little Mermaid racist? I don't I'm not sure. I I don't know. This is why I brought this up is because I was interested in what you think about it. Was someone just hmm. was it some Danish person who just like doesn't speak English that well and, and just, just wanted wrote... to join in and be like, yeah, I'm anti-racist. And so they just found this fish. Yeah. Or I thought really deeply and I'm like, are they saying that it's a racist fish because she the Little Mermaid left her race of being a fish and tried to become a human. And she was like trying right. to like right. leave her race of fish behind. Okay, I don't think it's that one, but love where your head's at. I'm going to say probably Hans Christian Andersen was racist. Oh, really? Maybe. I mean, I don't I know. That's like everyone all I can was think racist. Of. Isn't that the whole like problem po point yeah, that, yeah. Is that everyone's been racist i don't that would be my guess i don't know i, I don't really know. didn't look too much into it someone because, tell us in the comments yeah because i didn't want you know what i just didn't want to go down that rabbit hole this yeah. is already too haunted and that would be too much Sometimes now this one says the real life hauntings are worse than, so much worse yeah this one says free hong kong underneath it oh very cute <laughs> this one um she's been painted red and i don't know exactly what that was that protesting. seems like a PETA move yeah. like this bitch thinks that it's okay to to be a fish be a fish <laughs> fuck you fish are dying every day <laughs> right and then this one it was painted and blue and this thing gets vandalized all the times like people started doing it in the 60s That's sad it's even been beheaded what yeah so someone anonymously chopped its head off which would not be easy because this is a bronze statue and then they couldn't find the head and then anonymously like a few weeks later the head turned up at a tv station a news station. I don't understand. I they literally took it off of its rock with dynamite. What? They blasted it, um, covered it in post its, covered it. It's been covered in so many things so many times. Why? Shrouded though? it. That's what I, my thing is, is like I feel like it's just a super infamous spot. You know, like it's like the Times the Times New Square. What is it? Times New Roman? Times Square? <laughs> Times Square. <laughs> the Times yeah. New Square. Yeah, the Times New Roman Square. Yeah. 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 Like Times Square would yeah. be somewhere where like um you a know protest protests or... would happen because mm -hmm. it's it's such an infamous location. They know people are okay. going to see it. Yeah, or like the Statue of Liberty or yeah, something exactly. like that. Okay, I got right. you. Um, so I wrote here, The Little Mermaid is a bronze statue by Edvard Erickson depicting a mermaid becoming human. The statue was created in tribute to the Danish storyteller Anderson. The sculpture is displayed on a rock by the water slide at Langelini Promenade in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's four foot tall and weighs about 385 pounds. Okay. It's been a major tourist attraction since its unveiling in 1913. And in recent decades, it's become a very popular target for defacement by vandals and political activists who have blown her head off of its perch, beheaded her, sawed her arms off, used dynamite, and painted her so many times that it's hard to keep track. So, yeah, that's... We, we talked about the... Um, the statue in Copenhagen de, de, that's dedicated to the Little Mermaid. But I think if anything that shows you what a symbol of Denmark and Copenhagen specifically right. this statue is and that's how true. important Hans Christian Andersen is to the the canon of Danish history, right. shall I say. You know what? 
I'm starting now that you've said this, I'm kind of thinking maybe the graffiti that said racist fish actually was not a commentary at all about the Little Mermaid right. or Hans Christian Andersen. Maybe as you're saying, it's really one of the few landmarks there. Right. So maybe it's more a commentary on the history of Denmark. Perhaps the oh. history of Denmark has some, you know, dark twists and turns that mm-hmm. they were trying to draw attention to. And this is this statue is like a symbol of right. Denmark and its culture and history. Right. Maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. You know what? If you are Danish, um, go ahead and comment below. And also let me know if you know my family that's there. (laughs) Say hello to them. Um, So Hans Christian Andersen, like I said, the people freaking love him there. Mm -hmm. And but he he was a man who endured, as I came to know, many, many hardships in his life. And then that is why he created these fairy tales and these stories. He was really turning his pain into art. He was born extremely, extremely poor. Mm. And his father, interestingly enough, like after he became famous, had um, it became known that he had claimed to be distantly related to nobility. But then when people looked into it, those claims were they appearing to be unfounded. Gotcha. So I'm not sure the story behind that. Was he just like, you know, trying to say that? Was Hans trying to plant that rumor to make it seem like he was legit? I don't know. Honestly, if I was born into somewhat of a caste system where yeah. like... Like your lineage is all that matters. I would create rumors. I'd be like, right. "Oh, actually, I heard Allie is the uh, the forgotten princess." Yeah, it's just me in an alley, like <laughs> whispering to, "Hey, Allie in an alley." Yeah, like whispering to people, like, "Hey, did you hear that that girl Allie from Let's Get Haunted actually is distantly related to George Washington?" <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I would do the same thing. That's I don't blame him. Idea, right? Like, what's it called? Um, a whisper campaign. It is now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Hans Christian Andersen also was baptized on the 15th of April in 1805, but his certificate of birth was not even drafted up until November 1823. So almost 20 years between him being baptized and him being, uh, or him, yeah, as a child and him being, um, having like his birth certificate and written out Mm -hmm. shows you what kind of like, you know, how important he was to Denmark, which was not very important. Um, Anderson's father, who had received only an elementary school education, introduced his son to literature and he wrote uh, he read him Arabian Nights. And that and and that is really the book that got Anderson excited and really made Mm -hmm. him like his imagination go wild and made him want to start writing himself. Now, his mother, her name was Anne Marie. She was an illiterate washerwoman. And when Anderson was only 11 years old, his father died and he left the family just very broke. They had no options. So the boy was sent off to go do factory work and he, he didn't last very long doing that because Anderson was a very kind of... He wasn't very athletic of a child. Okay. It's written that he was gawky, that he was l- lanky, that like children made fun of him. They Aww. made fun of his appearance. Um, And he was sort of bullied at school, but he was also didn't like the other children. He just wasn't he didn't fit in. I'll say that he didn't okay. fit in. Um, And following the father's death in 1816, his mother then remarried in 1818. And then he the boy was sent to a local school for poor children. So it was like a trade school rather than getting like an education. Mm -hmm. He was learning skills. And he received basic education there. He worked as an apprentice to a weaver and later to a tailor. But he really didn't like it. And at 14, he moved to Copenhagen to finally seek employment as an actor. So he wanted to be an actor. And acting back then was very different. So he had this beautiful voice that he would use to recite tales because he was so into reading. He was really bullied by other children. He really would stick to himself. And while everyone else would be playing, he would be reading and writing. And then he started reciting all of these stories. And he had this beautiful singing voice where he was a baritone, which is really high. And right isn't a baritone really low? Is it? Michael, engineer, you're the tiebreaker. Is it yeah. high or low? Baritone. Low. Low. Okay. Michael says low. Well, then he didn't. Well, well <laughs> let, let me see. Maybe I wrote it down. He had a voice that really stuck out. Let's That's, say. You could be a baritone and yeah. have a really sick voice. Yeah, yeah. He had a voice that really, really stuck out. Oh, here's what it was. He he had an excellent soprano voice oh, when he there we moved go. to Denmark. Okay. Or when he moved to Copenhagen, rather. So he was 14. But then as he hit puberty and became older, it changed to baritone. Oh, gotcha. So he was accepted into the Royal Danish Theater because he had this beautiful angelic voice. But then when his voice changed, 
everyone told him that no 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 you don't belong here you're not good whatever and there and someone specifically told him you know what I think you should be a writer. You're really a poet. That's what they mm. said. They're like, you're not, I don't really see you as a singer. I see it's you like more a, as a poet. It's like a backhanded compliment. I it's know. like you're trying really hard to fulfill your dream as like a podcaster. And they're like, you know what? I actually don't think you're a very good podcaster. You know what I see you as? I see you as sitting uh, in a house by yourself, <laughs> writing something without yeah. your face being involved. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To be told... To be told to try something else when you're really passionate about something, yes, it it is heartbreaking. I really do mm-hmm. think it is heartbreaking, um, especially if you're a competitive person, which I think so many people are. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, here is a photo of Hans' childhood home. This is like oh. a landmark in Denmark. Like I said, Very they cute. saved it. Um, you want to describe it to everyone? Sure. It looks like it's one story tall. It has a sloping roof that is reddish in color. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just looks very Danish. Like think of yeah, um, like a fairy tale, like a fairy tale house. Yeah. It's like a cottage. I yes. would say like a cottage, but it's on an industrial street. Right. Yes. Like a cottage. Exactly. So. Um, Jonas Collin, though, who was the director of the Royal Danish Theater that Anderson had joined, he really took a liking to Anderson. And he mm. says, you know what? I'm going to send you to grammar school because I think there is some credence to you being a writer. And he even persuaded the king to pay for Anderson's education. So Anderson now learns to read and write. And he was not a stellar pupil, it's written, um, even though he attended school and he was there until 1827. And it's later said that these years, which I relate to, these years of being in school were the darkest and most bitter years of his life. At one particular school, he lived at the schoolmaster's house and it's said that he was abused there and he was told that it was done in order to, quote, improve his character. And he later said that the faculty of that school had discouraged him from writing, which led to depression as well. Um, Like I said, he was tall. He was gawky. People made fun of his appearance and he was he was physically and awkward and and homely. He said, quote, I shall have no success with my appearance. Um, And he said, so I'll make use with whatever else is available. So to Mm. me, that's kind of him saying, you know what? I'm not going to have any of the easy way out. I was born poor. I was born unattractive. Everyone thinks I'm kind of weird. My voice thing didn't work out. But you know what's working for me is the writing. I think I'm really good at that. And so he continued to do that. And even though he wasn't popular with it at first, at first when he was writing, everyone was telling him besides that one person who was his friend. Right. A lot of people were telling him, you know what, you're not any good. You need to give it up, whatever. But I feel like that's also what people say to people who are talented. Like if you have people willing to take time out of their day to say you're not good, Mm -hmm. it means you inspired some sort of reaction out of them. And that's that's like the whole point of art. Right. Yeah. So also with his sex life. Um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding his sex life. Oh. So, like I said, Anderson is a national hero in Denmark. Okay. So no one is going to – people are not going to be quick to say that he was like a pervert or he was this or he was that. And it's also hard for us to know what his sexual identity was because at the time that – Anyone who wasn't like being straight was all there was. Right. Right. There were no other options. There were no other options. And so if you weren't exactly straight, that's not something that you're going to talk about out in public. So what we do know from him and his personal life and his sex life comes from his journals. Now, I'm going to tell you what was found in his journals and you can come to your own conclusions. First of all, you how fucking rude. Burn my (laughs) journals if I die. Do not like turn them into some like don't put them in the history books. Right. Like she wrote this in her journal. Like, right. no, that shit was for no one to see ever. <laughs> um, so it said that uh, Anderson never was celibate by some people and that he never got to sleep with a woman because he was, quote, pining after women he could never have. Mm. Like he was lusting after women who were out of his league, essentially. Okay. And um, he only courted two women publicly during his lifetime. Who One was the sister of a student friend who soon became engaged to another man. Mm-hmm. And the other was a Swedish singer named Jenny Lind who was only friends with him. Okay. So in one case, he got friend zoned. And in the other case, 
case, it sounds like he also got friends. Yeah, um, yeah. Sort of. Or may not have even been friends in that other case. That other yeah. girl may have been like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> Quickly, let me marry someone else so you leave me alone. Right, like maybe he only wrote about them in his journal and like, we don't know because yeah. it's only from his side. Um, and it said in his in his time, he spent all of his time reading, dreaming, sewing costumes out of scraps for his puppet theater um, and, quote, haunting the doorway of the Ooh. city's theater when traveling players came to town. So to me, I feel like I kind of get why people might have thought he was a little weird, like he's doing his own puppet shows and putting on right. plays and hanging out and being like, oh, you're an actor. Like, mm, right. Let me talk he just he seems like, yeah, he's a little socially awkward. Right. And like, let's be real. It's still hard for people who are socially awkward today. But mm -hmm. I think it's easier because we have dating apps. So you right. can like if you're not good at putting yourself out there at a bar, mm -hmm. you can just go on a dating app and be like, this person already matched with me. They already think I'm hot. Yeah. Like that's. 70% of the battle. Right. I know. Like now we just go meet up and hopefully like I'm not too weird for the hour. I'm getting a drink with this person. I, right? I'll, I'll say something in hopes that it helps some people's lives out. When I was single, I found socially awkward people to be incredibly like sexy like I really oh, yeah. liked that someone was socially mm -hmm. awkward because I felt like they weren't going to lie to me. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So then other people report that. Perhaps Anderson didn't have any sex. Perhaps he was celibate. Because when we look into his stories, he it says he, quote, had a refusal to have sexual relations. But then other people said that's because he's in love with an unattainable women. So in my mind, he's like, OK, I'm I'm really attracted to these like beautiful actress dancer types that I'm like spending all my time around. But they are not interested in me. OK, but I will to your point about we don't really know what his sexual identity or preference was. Right. That's like um. Somebody tweeted at us recently because we made a joke about Isaac Newton being a virgin and they were like, he wasn't a virgin. He was gay. Oh. But like because he like that wasn't a thing that you could come out and say during that time period. Right. People were just like, oh, he's never with women. He never has a girlfriend. He never got married. Yeah. He's celibate. Right. Oh, okay. So it could be a similar situation with Hans Christian well, Anderson. We don't know. It's funny that you bring that up because privately in his journals, he seems to be obsessed with a man named Edward Collins Ooh. and then with a young theology student who um, and then also a handsome young ballet dancer. Um, the the last person, the ballet dancer, ended up returning some of this interest interest to some degree or so he like insinuates in his journals. Um, but these are aspects that are largely ignored by the history books because we're not sure. Maybe they're just homophobic. Maybe they're, you know, like maybe he was bisexual and that's they're refusing to accept that. We don't know. And then another person or another historian says that he had tons of sex and he was a pervert because he used to keep in his diary extensive logs of his masturbation habits what does that have to do for okay, so whatever it said go that, ahead and tell me it said that <laughs> when he masturbated he used a plus symbol to denote a really good one a session of a comma a nut i don't know and that he masturbated a whole lot based off of this okay now i don't know like in his journal was it like a plus sign equals i came i don't know how yeah, they I figured no that out idea. um i i really don't know right what if a plus sign just meant like i saw a really pretty bird today outside my window and then this historian is like no he was a pervert and he was coming every night <laughs> well well um it's also said that after receiving visitors he would frequently go upstairs and he like would do that because he wrote in his journal about it oh. i don't know um and he would picture the new like people who were walking into his house like if you were a stranger he came to his house later that night in his journal or whatever he would be like this afternoon a beautiful young lad came into the house and then i had to get away and plus sign oh i don't know interesting. i don't know but then also they said that uh when he used to visit brothels in copenhagen the women who the sex workers who were there they said that he would just watch them undress or just talk to them like he never oh, had sex with them um so well i mean I a lot know. of that can be social awkwardness as well yeah. right yeah and the reason i'm telling you so much about anderson is because when we get into his stories you'll be able to see how his personal life because he like endured so much pain and hardship was translated into these um but a huge part about hans christian anderson 
in the history books is his for some reason people are obsessed with his sex life like people talk mm. about that often like oh did you know he was gay and then other people are like no he was celibate and other people are like he was a freak and then yeah. some people are like he never had sex you right know? right but like people are really fixated on his sex life because he in his journals as one would because you're not showing it to anyone talked right. about sex interesting um and then someone else said i believe he never had a sexual relationship and yeah so um also, in his, he wrote his own book, too, where some of these facts are taken from. It's called The Story of My Life. So I feel like we could possibly trust some of these facts, right? Okay. And he talks about how he learned his Danish folktales that he wrote about from old women in the spinning room at an insane asylum who would talk to him there and tell him about Arabian Nights and stuff. And they like all said that he was a great writer and that he had so much talent. And he would recite some of his stories and stuff to these okay. women who were in the same asylum. And they were like, you're fantastic. Now, we, as we know, in the past, quote, insane asylums were not necessarily places where people Good like point. were treated very well. Like you could yeah. just be someone who didn't have any mental illness and you were just there because you disagreed with like the modern Your husband. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. maybe these were just like women who were so bored because they're like forced to be in this right. um, this like institution that they don't belong in. And then they have this they're so lucky to have this like, you know, amazing writer come in and tell them stories. Could be. Or another way it could be interpreted is that his, you know, stories were amusing people who weren't necessarily had all of their faculties, like, faculties left. Yeah. I and I, I will say because Natalia and I were in a sorority in college and our um, philanthropy, part of it was going to the old folks home. Mm -hmm. And I will say great audience because they are which is I, I suppose is sort of sad. A lot of people in old folks home have kind of been forgotten by their families. Right. And their families have placed them in this home because they're like, we can't take care of you anymore. We have, well, yeah, we have to do capitalism. We have to do society. Sorry. Yeah, like, sorry. You have to go here because I have to go to work. Exactly. Yeah. And so when you go into the old folks home, a lot of those people are just so excited for you to say anything to them. Right. So it could have been a situation like that as well. People forgotten by their families living in this institution and now someone's coming and speaking to them and they're just so stoked. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And Anderson really used his time to and I say asylum because that's like what it was referred to then. I guess we could say institution now, but I, I want to call them asylums because I, I feel like calling it an institution is disrespectful for the people who went through what they had to go through. Right. There. You know, like mm -hmm. I wouldn't call like a torture house a hospital. You oh, know good what I mean? point. I see what you're saying. Um, OK, so. Also, um, so people were saying, you know what, you've got this talent, you're really good at this, why don't you write? And so he did. And we can see in some of his his first tale, like one of his first tales that he wrote is called The Tallow Candle. And it's written in the 1820s, and it's about a candle that didn't feel appreciated. Oh, no. And it was written, That's so sad. I know. <laughs> it was written while Anderson was in school during those dark times he talked to, and he dedicated it to one of the teachers at the school. That's really sad. And then he wrote Fairy Tales Told for Children, which was um, published in a set of three installments between May 1835 and May of an April of 1837. And this one really represented Anderson's bulk of his like most famous works. In these, we got to see The Princess and the Pea, Thumbelina, The Little Mermaid, and The Emperor's New Clothes. The New Emperor's New Clothes. And what's funny is that those are super famous stories that mm -hmm. everyone knows to these days. But would you believe that Danish review? of the first two booklets that appeared in 1836 said that they that it wasn't good the critics said that he was too chatty his storytelling was too informal he had immorality and they and it, it, his story writing was disgusting and they said that children's literature you know is mean to it's supposed to educate it's not supposed to entertain people it's not oh, supposed to amuse people and the critics really were like you should just quit writing altogether you're shit you should avoid this type of style like fairy tales are not for you writing for children is clearly not for you and this affected him so much that he took a full year before publishing any more stories because he was so affected by their hate the haters yeah yeah and um someone even wrote about him that anderson <laughs> anderson um as a novelist is characterized as a quote 
possibility of a personality wrapped up in such a web of arbitrary moods and moving through an elegiac duodecimal scale of almost echoless dying tones just as easily roused as subdued who in order to become a personality needs a strong life development i understood about 25 percent of what that person said but i understood that it was a burn right yeah. right so there i don't know what egg legally elegiac through an elegiac what the fuck i don't know um, duo decimal dewey decimal system duo decimal scale i think they're like referring maybe those are words to describe poetry like iambic pentameter or like you know like the beats of poetry i don't know someone tell us in the comments but basically they're saying in order to be like interesting at all he needs to develop his own life as a person which is oh, really got it. rude okay i got it so he's writing about things that he hasn't experienced so it comes off as like not having any sub substance is what they're saying i don't know i think maybe they're just haters oh, like they okay. knew like who's this guy he's from nowhere he's silly looking to us and he's like playing with puppets like let's just destroy him because i had to go you know like yeah i'm just a hater okay um somewhere along the way he became suddenly cool and then everyone wanted to be that everyone wanted to be his fucking friend he made friends with the royalty they all wanted they started writing ballets about the stories he told he they started writing operas about his stories um he became friends with charles dickens who by the way said he was a fucking weirdo do you know who charles dickens is yes of course so one summer, Anderson gets invited to uh, England in a, on June of 1847, and he is really successful this summer. So he there he meets Dickens, and then ten years later he tells Dickens like, "Hey, I'm gonna come stay come stay um, with you." And he's supposed to only be there for like a few days, but his visit turns into five weeks, and everyone's like, "What the fuck?" And apparently, on his first morning there, he proclaimed that it was like a Danish tradition for one of the sons of the households to shave him huh and okay. the dickens were like no we're gonna send you to a barber yeah like we're not gonna put our son through that yeah and so they sent him to a local barber and then they also said that like he was prone to tantrums and he would like throw fits out in the yard and one time after reading like a particularly like harsh critic uh critique rather of his play he like just went out in the in the yard and had a tantrum um and was just like banging his hands well on the sounds like he stuff. may have been a weirdo yeah, I don't know. Or maybe had some sort of a social, you know, um, whatever. Maybe he had like some sort of mental thing. I'm not sure. Um, and then when he finally left, Dickens wrote and displayed on the door of where he had stayed. Hans Anderson slept in this room for five weeks, which seemed to the family ages. <laughs> and then he stopped responding to Anderson's letters, which ended their relationship, obviously. Now, it's kind of sad because while Dickens, like, obviously, like, thought Anderson was weird, Anderson doesn't understand why he stopped their correspondence. He was like, oh, I thought we had, you know, like a lovely rapport. I yeah. don't understand. I mean, look. You can be understanding all you want, but if you have a house guest that was supposed to stay like a couple days mm -hmm. who then you just can't get rid of for right. five weeks, like that's rude. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would be like, I'm not, I'm also not going to invite this person back into my home because he may just never leave. Right. I know. Yeah. I know. It's just so awkward. Um, so, yeah, like I said, the works of Hans Christian Andersen became known throughout the world. He is like a Cinderella story where mm -hmm. he, you know, is like went from rags to riches on his own. And he became friends with all these different royal families, including the Romanovs. Now, do you remember Ooh, what happened to the Romanovs? They got murdered. Yeah, we talk about that in our episode Fabergé of Fabergé eggs. eggs. Um, so all I'm saying is this bitch was haunted. Yep. Okay. Sounds he had haunted about right. energy. Here's another photo of him looking particularly haunted. If you want to describe that to our blind listeners. Yes. Okay. So we have a very tall man. I will say he looks very tall, very skinny. Um, he's holding on. Oh, which goes back to how people described him as gawky. Yeah. Um, he's holding on to the side of a staircase. Mm -hmm. He's got one hand given a little bit of attitude. It's right. coming out of his pocket. <laughs> he's got his, a little hip thing going on and he has an Abraham Lincoln hat yeah, on. Yeah, like a big hat. Yeah. And he, to me, this is like Dickens, like Charles Dickens, like a Christmas story. That's the time that we were living in. So like that period of how everyone wears like long coats and mm -hmm. the women are like very like Victorian style, I would say. Is that? Sure. Um, Tiny Tim style. Yeah, Tiny Tim style. Tiny Tim core. 
Um, and it's funny because Anderson, after he became successful, didn't understand his success. He was like, I guess I'm popular now. Um, it says that he wrote in his, uh, he wrote, quote, a star of fortune hangs above me. Thousands have deserved it more than I. Often I cannot understand why this good should have been vouchsafed for me among so many thousands. But if the star should set, even while I am penning these lines, be it so, still I can say that it has shown, and I have received a rich portion. All right. <laughs> yeah. You want to describe in modern English what that means? Uh, No idea. So he's... <laughs> really? Okay, maybe I, I may, didn't read it good enough. Maybe he's saying like, okay. You know what it is? I may have been distracted. I don't know if you guys could hear it by like some banging around in the background oh, the of ghost. whoever is. Yeah. Whatever ghost is haunting behind this wall. So basically he's saying, I'm in this profession mm -hmm. where there's so it's so competitive like to be a famous writer. And there are th so many thousands of people who deserve success more than I do. Okay. And if... If, you know, but I will say that I have gotten success. And if my success runs out this very instant, like if I just am no longer famous and no one ever reads my things ever again, I'll be grateful that if somehow I tricked the system into being successful for this Got amount it. of time. Good for him. Yeah. He's making the most of it. Now, he something that I feel like he relates to you and is that he was terrified of being buried alive for no reason. <laughs> For no reason. He had a ton of phobias. He was afraid of dogs. He was afraid of pork because he was afraid that he was uh, contract like this rare disease that's in pork okay. called trichinae, um, which is a parasite that's found in pigs. And he also kept a long rope in his luggage while he was traveling in case he needed to escape a fire. He even feared that he would accidentally be buried alive. So before bed each night, he propped up a note on his chest that read, I only appear to be dead. <laughs> Because he was afraid someone would come in and be like, oh, this guy's dead. Let's go ahead and put and, him in a coffin. And then bury him alive. But I think that, like, you know how you and I, like, are all, like, this podcast has made us more, like, anxious and scared? Yeah. I feel like it's the same. Like, he's writing all these crazy fairy yeah. tales where, like, a mermaid turns into a person for one evening. And, and then turns into foam and disappears. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so he's like, anything can happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so ironically, he was so afraid of uh, dying in this weird way. And then in 1872, at the age of only 67, he fell out of his bed and he was severely hurt and he never fully recovered. Wow. And then later it came to be that he showed signs of liver cancer Oof. and he eventually died on August 4th of 1875 in a house that's hauntedly called Rolichade, which literally means calmness near Copenhagen. And he was at the home of one of his close friends when he died but shortly before his death in an almost romantic way he consulted a composer about the music for his funeral and he said quote most of the people who will walk after me will be children so make the beat of the music keep time with tiny footsteps oh yeah and at the time of his death he was also internationally revered and the danish government had been paying him a stipend annually as their national treasure wow now, let's delve into the plot of his most famous tales before we get into some more dark and obscure haunted ones that you definitely haven't heard of. Okay. Before we get into The Little Mermaid, is there anything you want to say about The Little Mermaid? Do you, do you know of this story? It sounds like, because you said something about disappearing into the sea foam. Maybe you know a little bit more. Yes. So I had a book of Hans Christian Andersen um, fairy tales when I was younger, mm -hmm. and it was the original version, I believe. Oh, wow. And so haunted. I know that that she she doesn't like live happily ever after in the original version mm -hmm. um i don't remember it exactly but i do know that she dies at the end and it like her body turns into sea foam so there this the little mermaid is actually some like tale that has been taken down and then uh through the annals of history the annals yes say. yep and down then, out uh, the anus of history hans christian anderson wrote that and published it so it's been told many times this is a very old story kind of like i don't know um what's like a really old story like the tortoise and the hare like, yeah who created it who's to say yeah you know um so 
it, it was a 1989 Disney film, but before that, it was written in 1837 and made famous by the Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen. So as we know, in the Disney film version, Ariel makes a deal with the sea witch Ursula, who conver- converts her into being a human being temporarily in exchange for her singing voice. And then she puts the singing voice inside of a seashell. And then a bunch of chaos ensues and everyone lives happily ever after eventually, right? right? Yeah. Now, that is not what happened in the original. In the original, the story follows a journey of a young mermaid who's willing to give up her life in the sea as a mermaid to gain a human soul. This is a huge part of the story. So it's rather than her wanting to be with this man, like so that she can like experience true love. In reality, she wants to have a human soul. And the only way she can get a human soul is by taking some of his soul. And when you Mm. love someone, you give a piece of your soul to them. Beautiful. Like soulmates, right? Yeah, yeah. So the only way she can get a soul for herself is to get the soul from the prince. So what happens is, is that there's this little mermaid living in the ocean, as one does. And she has the most beautiful singing voice in the entire world. As we know, sirens do. Mermaids do. That's part of the folklore. They have beautiful singing voices. They lure sailors to their death with their voices. Correct? Yes. Yes. She lives in this underwater kingdom and she lives with her widowed father and a bunch of her sisters. And they have this sort of culture where when a mermaid turns 15, she's permitted to swim up to the surface and look at the world around her. Now, they're allowed to do this once they become of age, one time per year. So Ariel is the youngest of all the sisters and she keeps hearing tales of her sisters who say like, oh, I saw this really sick rock or like clouds or, you know, just telling her all these tales of, of what happens above exactly and so she's like so interested in the world above and she's like even making effigies of the sun out of like clams and stuff on the floor and she's just so interested in the world above her now she begins to like look forward to her turn to go up so when she finally does go up to the surface she looks out and she sees a ship and on this ship there's a birthday celebration happening for this prince and as a prince's birthday celebration on a ship would be it's fucking lit it's awesome there's a bunch of cool shit and she's like holy shit that was fucking awesome she goes back down and she uh no holy shit that was fucking awesome and now before she goes back down a storm comes in a violent Mm. storm comes in it sinks the ship and she saves the prince She saves him from drowning. She puts him on the shore next to this castle and she waits by his body until some other humans come down, a woman from the castle and her ladies in waiting. And they see the prince and then the little mermaid like goes away because she's like, oh, okay, like, you know, he uh, he's been saved. Like, I, I have to go back down. It's time for me to go back down. Now, when she goes back down, she's already fallen in love with this prince. And even though she's the one who saved him from drowning, he never even knew she was there because he was like passed out or whatever. And so he never realizes that she saved him. He goes on thinking that the woman and her ladies in waiting that came are the ones who saved him. Because when he wakes up, he's just like, oh, uh, castle bitch, you saved me. Thank you. (laughs) Now, the Little Mermaid obviously becomes sad at this. And so she asks her grandmother if humans can live forever. And the grandmother explains to her that humans have a much shorter lifespan than the mermaid's 300-year lifespan. And she explains that when mermaids die, mermaids turn into sea foam and then they cease to exist. But humans have an eternal soul that lives on in heaven. Mm. So the little mermaid hears this and she's like, I want to be with the prince. I want an eternal soul so we can be together forever. So she visits a sea witch who lives in a very dangerous part of the ocean. And this is a very dark witch, right? As we know with dark magic it never turns out the way that you think it should. Right. There's consequence. It's like selling your soul to the devil. Yeah, you get fame, but at what cost? Right. Right. Like we talked about last episode. Exactly. So the witch sells a mermaid this potion, and the potion is going to give her legs in exchange for her beautiful voice. But there's a catch. Once the little mermaid becomes a human, she'll never be able to return to the sea. And then furthermore, consuming the potion, the the potion consuming the potion <laughs> is going to make the little mermaid feel as if quote a sword is being passed through her body I do remember this yes but when she recovers she'll have two human legs and she'll be able to dance better than any human ever could but it's going to be extremely painful it's going to feel like she's literally dancing on sharp knives now in addition she has to obtain a soul if she's going to be human 
Um, so she has to get the prince to love her and marry her because only then the soul will flow into her. Otherwise, at dawn on the first day after the prince marries another, the little mermaid will die with a broken heart and dissolve into the sea foam up behind the waves. Now, to me, that sounds like risky deal. You know? Oh, for sure. I feel like big risk, big reward, though. You know. Well, I think so. The difference is. Either she lives for 300 years right. and then ceases to exist, or she takes this chance where she mm-hmm. might die in like a week's time, right. or she can you know, live a human lifespan of mm-hmm. like 70, 80 years, yeah. back then probably less. And then um, live forever. And then live forever in heaven. Yeah. So it's right. a, you're right. It's a it's it does seem like a trade off. Do you want 300 years in a mortal form and then yeah. nothing? Or do you want 60 years in human form and then live on forever as a, as your soul? What in would heaven? you choose? I don't know. I was really? just thinking about that. I really don't know. I mean, I just like the idea of being a mermaid. Yeah. I mean, that would be sick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hell yeah wow it's always brighter on the other side of yeah the, it really the, is the clock and as sebastian <laughs> said in the little mermaid darling it's better down where, where it's wetter, wetter under, under the, the sea. sea he's trying to tell her it you know grass is always greener on the other side but i'm telling you it's pretty sick down here yeah that's yeah. true that's true so what do you think happens uh well i think she chooses the man mm-hmm. and she attempts to marry him but Perhaps it doesn't work out. She, exactly. She's like, you know what? S- sounds good. Sign me up. She chugs the potion and then she feels a sword going through her body as she passes out on the shore. She wakes up and she has human legs. She's found naked on the shore by the prince. And then he sees this naked, beautiful woman washed up on shore. And he's just so like, he just thinks she's the most beautiful, amazing thing, even though she can't talk. Right. And here's a photo of him or not a photo. This is actually, you know what? This is a photo. This is, this is a photo. <laughs> This is a verified historical photo. Finding the the princess who just drank the potion and is naked on the shore. Yes. Can you want to describe that sure. to our blind listeners? Um, it looks like Ariel has two legs. She's on a step of something that is leading out to the ocean and her body is being covered by her long hair and then there's the prince um, kind of standing over her. Right, and he's just like, wow, she doesn't speak. She's so beautiful and graceful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how I like my women, exactly. quiet. Yeah. Now, she dances for him despite suffering from suffering from excruciating pain and he fucking loves this dancing he's like yeah dance bitch keep going yeah. and she's like oh it hurts so bad but he's falling in love with me right um but little does she know that he's not falling in love with her instead he fell in love or no he's not falling in love with her at all he says that he can't fall in love with her because he can only love the woman who saved him wow what from a the twist wreckage. but it was her all alone but it was her but she can't say that yeah. now this is what i hate about stories is because if this was me i would be doing charades and shit like to yeah be, i would be like it was me you, you dumb asshole yes, you dying you're drowning me or Swimming, swimming to get you. you from how do you not remember that a right. f- that a fish woman saved you, you yeah, yeah yeah you have to remember part of it right i know but he didn't i would yeah i'd write a note and be like look i can't talk because i sold my soul to a sea witch yeah. um or gave my voice to a sea witch i need your soul mm-hmm. if you don't marry me i'm turning into sea foam and then he'd read that and be like great i'm putting you in the insane asylum <laughs> um well what happens then though is like he's like you know what not only do i not love you i'm gonna marry this girl right now and they get on a ship they go on this marriage ship and they have a wedding and the poor beautiful mermaid or ex-mermaid princess is just watching from afar just staring mute ornamental and complacent just like well well fuck yeah you know what am i supposed to do i took this gamble it didn't work out now she's in quite a pickle because she's gonna die before dawn if the prince marries another person and she didn't get his soul because he didn't fall in love with her so what do you think happens next this is the real the real twist i think there's a storm and she has to save him again or something what happens is is this came out of nowhere i was super surprised her sisters rise out of the water and they bring her a dagger from the sea witch i do remember this that they got and it 
in exchange for their long, beautiful hair. Yes. Now, they say if the mermaid pr- kills the prince and she lets his blood drip all over her feet, she'll become a mermaid once more I and her suffering this. is all going to end and she can live out her full life in the ocean with her family. And it's basically like he never existed and she never made the deal. And she goes and she and here's a photo of that. Would you like to see? I'll put that up on the screen right now. Yes. Um. So, yep. There's all of her sisters. They're greeting her while she's on this ship. Uh-huh. And uh, their hair is gone. I mean, they have short hair. But, yeah, their beautiful long hair is gone. And so she approaches the prince while he's sleeping in the bed with his new wife, which must be very painful her, for her to do. And she has this dagger. And, and she's just like, you know what? <sighs> I can't I, I, do I love it. him. Mm-hmm. I can't. Yeah, I can't. And so she throws herself and the dagger off of the ship into the water just as the dawn breaks and her body dissolves into foam. But instead of ceasing to exist, she feels the warm sun and she discovers that she's turned into a luminous and ethereal earthbound spirit, Ooh. a daughter of the air. And as the Little Mermaid ascends into the atmosphere, she's greeted by other daughters of the air who tell her that she's become just like them because she strove with all her heart to obtain an immortal soul. And because of her selflessness, the Little Mermaid is given a chance to earn her own soul by doing good deeds for mankind for 300 years. And one day, After completing the 300 years of good deeds, she will rise up into heaven. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, that's not a haunted ending. She gets to go to heaven by doing good deeds for mankind for 300 years. Mm -hmm. No, that's a fucking horrible ending because do you realize (laughs) how much easier it would be to just marry a rich prince than it would be to do 300 years of good good service for mankind? Very true. This poor little mermaid is doing deeds to this day. She's literally still oh, doing you're it. Oh, right. Because this was written in the 1800s. Wow. So yeah. she has to see people deface her statue after all of the pain that she went through. I. It's hard for me to do good deeds for mankind now. Just like, you know? Yeah. So like, I can only imagine what it's like to do that for 300 years when you're not even a human. Yeah. Good point. And now she's stuck. So, you know, like we've said before, there are worse things than death. Right. Yes. So it sounds like she's in a sort of purgatory. Sort of. But she doesn't see it that way. Yeah. Well, she's a good person. So she's stoked. (laughs) Yeah. We're not. So (laughs) we're upset about it. Now, here's a couple other stories um, that you might not have heard. And they're called 10 Obscure and Deeply Odd Fairy Tales Written by Hans Christian Andersen by Delilah M. Rainey for Listverse.com. Now, she has taken these Danish stories, which have been translated into English, and she has summarized them into very small sort of little stories that I will tell now that no one has ever heard of. Most likely, I hadn't heard of these, but they're very, very haunted. And if okay. you guys are interested in them, you can look into them yourself. Okay. Because they're very long. Each one is like, you know. A billion years. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm just giving you guys like the spark notes, okay? The first one is called The Stone of the Wise Men. Have you heard of this? No. These are actually very entertaining. I'm very excited to open this up for you. Okay. I'm ready. What do you think it's about? The Stone of the Wise Men? Yeah. I think he has a stone. He's a wise man. He has a stone, but the stone is not what it seems. Mm. That is my guess. What? Wow. wow, you should be a writer. Oh, goodness. <laughs> in the tallest tree in India stands a castle made of crystal that looks out over the whole entire world. In this castle lives a very wise man who owns a book in which everything ever known is written. Mm. He seeks answers about what will happen after death, but the page in the book concerning the afterlife cannot be read without the light from a magical stone made from the good qualities that hold the world together. Okay. Seems not fair. Yeah, seems impossible. <laughs> the wise man has five children, and each of them is blessed with one particularly well-developed devel- sense. One can see further than anyone else in the world, even deep into the earth and into the human heart. One can hear grass growing. One can smell everything there is to smell. One has the most accurate and advanced taste. And the fifth, a blind daughter, can feel more vividly than anyone else, as though she has eyes in her fingertips and ears in her heart. 
Okay. You Sleep hear like her. you hear like an insect beating its wings and it's just that's all you can hear and it's drowning out the other sounds around right. you. Like, sorry, I would love to listen to you, but there's yeah. a fly near me and I can't. <laughs> yeah, and also just like everyone is solving the world's problems and you're just like, just to let you guys know the grass is still growing outside. Yeah, just to let you know, don't worry. Yeah, the grass <laughs> is doing well. One by one, the children go out into the world to find the stone. The son who can see is blinded by an evil one. Mm. The son who can hear is driven insane by all of the screaming in the world and all of the heartbeats, which to him sound like a million clocks. Well, that's also a bummer. Yeah. He pushes his fingers so deep into his ears that he ruptures his own eardrums. The son who can smell is also thwarted with incense, smoke made by the evil one. The son who can taste ends up stuck atop a church steeple in a weather balloon. Now, I don't know how that happened, but it did. Okay. Now, the blind sister, the only one that's left, she ties a magical thread to her father's house so that she won't lose her way in a world. And she leaves to go find the stone. The evil one makes a doppelganger of her. Using stagnant marsh water bubbles mixed with tears shed by envy, and he paints it with rouge scraped from the cheeks of a corpse. Despite the evil one's best efforts, the daughter acquires the stone, which illuminates the wise man's book to reveal one word. What do you think the answer to death is, Alyssa? Life. Faith. Something stupid. Yeah. Faith. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. What do you think of that story? I th- I can see why it's not one of the popular ones. It starts off so good though. Like, oh, I really want to know what's in this book. Yeah. Right? Like what like what is well, the answer to death? Like clearly this writer is going to tell me. I'll go on this journey. Right. And then it's just a cop out. Yeah, it makes sense why some critics were reading his works and they'd get one good one, like the Emperor's New Clothes, and right. then they'd get this one. They're like, Why did the girl that can smell get stuck in a weather balloon? Right. <laughs> like I'm sure he, maybe he answers that. You guys maybe. read the whole story. Maybe yeah. he answers tell us, that. Tell us why. Now, this one is called The Elf Mound. Have you heard of The Elf Mound? I'm going to say um, because when we did the Filipino folklore episode with Sapphire, she talked about some creatures that live in ant mounds mm. and that they were gnome like mm. or elf like. So I wonder mm. if that's a similar thing thing for this story yeah and as we know because we did fairy like fairy mounds too i Mm -hmm. feel like this is you'll as you'll see when i tell the story i feel like this is like a translation of fairy mounds as well like an elf mound Mm -hmm. you know like a fairy hill we talked about fairy circles as well um so this story is about two lizards who are scrambling about the entrance of an old elf mound and they're commenting on the hustle and bustle within they can hear it They've heard the elf maidens who are practicing new dances, and they both wonder what could be the reason why. An old maid, elf, hurries out, and she summons a raven to deliver invitations to this important event. And the elf maidens begin their misty dances, and the dishes for the night's festivities include things that are disgusting, like skewered frogs, fungus salad made of mushroom seed, and hemlock. What is hemlock? I don't know, but I want to Google it. Google it. Okay. While you Google it, I'll tell the rest. Okay. They learn that a magnificent feast is to be held so that two Norwegian goblins may choose a bride from the elf king's fair daughters. These maidens are like masks. They're beautiful in front, but they're hollowed out behind so that their backs are completely empty. And a grave horse is to be invited to the feast. Do you know what a grave horse is? A dead horse? Yeah. So a grave horse is like this old Danish superstition where the a horse was buried alive underneath every church. What? And each night the dead horse would dig itself That's up. the most haunted thing that I've heard and, so far. And limp to the houses of those who are going to die. And then a night raven, the ravens that were sent to deliver the invitations. Do you know what those are? No. They're also another creature from old Danish superstition. And night ravens are born when a priest condemns a ghost to be buried into the earth. A stake is driven into the ground where the spirit is buried. And at midnight, when the ghost begins to scream, the stake is pulled out and the spirit is excommunicated, flying away in the form of a raven with a hole in his left wing. Yeah, these are the two most haunted things you've told me. And the feast itself is 
terrifying. It included things that I told you of, including... I know what hemlock is now. What is it? It is a poisonous flower plant that's part of the carrot family. Oh. It looks very pretty, which is probably why it's so dangerous. Carrots fuck you up. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Give me some more. (laughs) (laughs) They were eating children's fingers wrapped in in snail skins. Ew. And wine from grave cellars. Okay. And there's spit-roasted frogs and salads made from hemlock, damp mouse muzzles, and mushroom spawn. Then for dessert, they had sweets mixed with rusty nails and broken glass from church windows. Now, the Elf King's hollow masked daughters display their bizarre and mysterious array of gifts to the Goblin Lord and his sons. And the sons decide that they don't want a wife. Instead, they prefer to run around blowing out, quote, will of the wisps, which is kind of like, I'm going to play the field. Yeah. But the old Norwegian goblin decides that he likes one of his hollow daughters so much that he will marry him himself. And since she can tell stories about any subject, that's why he decides to marry her. All right. Well, at least that's kind of like marrying someone for their personality, which is a step up from most olden time stuff. Right. He's like, you know what? She's just a masked person who doesn't have a back, yeah. but she tells great stories. And yes. to me, that's really important to me. Absolutely. And then they swap boots instead of swapping rings and they dance into the night. Cute. What do you think of that story? Love it. I really I really like the grave horse and the night raven. Yeah, those that's all I can think about right now. I'm also still thinking about the daughter that had a great sense of smell of being trapped in a weather <laughs> balloon. <laughs> Maybe she like sm- she smelt something and the evil one like put a treat in something and then she got stuck in it. <laughs> like she's a dog. Yeah. Like she has just like a really good hound dog nose and she's like, "What? I smell beef jerky." And then she right. gets it and then yeah, the weather balloon floats away once she's in it. Hans you know what, Hans? You made it onto Let's Get Haunted. So yeah, you, you're we're gonna doing say, well. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> have you heard of The Shadow? This is my favorite of all the stories. No, I have not. So The Shadow is a story about this young man who's super well educated. And one day he cat he catches a glimpse of this beautiful maiden who's standing on a balcony as they do and he becomes obsessed with her he wants to learn who she is what she is everything he's like i saw this girl on a balcony she was the most beautiful thing i've ever seen i need to know everything about her so one night he jokingly tells his shadow to creep through the crack in this woman's door to learn everything he can about her the next morning the young man discovers instead that his shadow has gone It's just gone entirely. But he thinks, you know, this isn't so bad because a new shadow starts growing from the stump of the old shadow. Okay. And then with this brand new shadow, the young man returns home. And he's like, you know what? Everything's fine. My old shadow ran away, but I'm not going to think about that because that's very traumatic. And I feel like maybe I just hallucinated. I'm not sure. Yeah. If that happened to me, if I saw my shadow walk out the door, I would just be like, shit happens you know what that that would be devastating because you're like wait my shadow's been with me my entire life what did i do to offend my shadow so much that it was like you know what he was like you want me to creep on this girl you fucking weirdo i draw the line here yes exactly you know i put up with a lot of shit over the years but now you're too old to be behaving like this i'm leaving yes So what happens next is many years pass and a very thin and beautiful dressed stranger pays the man a visit. Now, who do you think this stranger is? Death. It's the old man's shadow or the man's old shadow. And he doesn't know that it's a that it's his old shadow. And he 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 asks, how do you recognize me? How do you know who I am? This this person comes up and knows everything about him. And he's like, you know what? I am your shadow. And what do you think the guy thinks of that? I think he fucks his shadow. <laughs> no. No? No, no, no. Oh. He says, you know what? I found in my otherworldly state, I crept into this ether twilight land, and I went into this house across the street, and I learned everything there is to know, including how to, to make myself a man. And then the shadow leaves naked into the world and he slid up shadows in the moonlight and peered through windows where he saw despicable things happening between husbands and wives and parents and children, things that no one ought to see, but everyone secretly wants to know the secret evil conduct of all of the neighbors. And with this knowledge, the shadow blackmailed and terrorized all of the people in the town into giving him money, beautiful clothes and prestige. More years pass, and the man who had the shadow falls into poverty, and his shadow eventually returns again and 
convinces his former master to come on a journey with him. So the former master doesn't really realize it yet, but the shadow actually wants the man to be his own shadow. So at, oh, I just got the chills. This is this is haunted. This is scary. I know. I just got the. Every time you get the chills, it gives me the chills. Uh, oh, so, okay. Yeah. They go to a healing. Oh, just bath imagine. House. Just imagine being tricked by your own shadow into becoming your shadow's shadow. The shadow tricks a princess into falling in love with him. Okay. And the shadow shows in a her bathhouse. At a healing bathhouse. Okay. All right. Yes. No, I just want to make sure I was following. Yes, at a bathhouse. Okay. okay. Yes. And probably because she was like naked and Hans was like, yeah, she's going to be naked in <laughs> yeah. here. Because like guys like always. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh. He's like, oh, I really, By the way, it I was really a- like this hot girl that doesn't like me because she's out of my league. Let me put her in the story as a princess and make her naked. Yeah, exactly. Plus sign, plus sign, plus sign. <laughs> So he tricks this princess into falling in love with her, uh, falling in love with him by showing her that his own shadow, who's really his old master, has a shadow too. And the princess finds this really impressive. (laughs) She's like, I've never seen a shadow that also has a shadow. This guy's fucking cool as fuck, right? And so she asks the shadow to marry her. But the former master tries to put a stop to the wedding. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not a shadow. I am a man. And it's not right for a woman to marry a shadow who's only pretending to be a man. And the shadow tells the princess that his shadow has gone mad. And he started to think that he's a real man. And then the princess gets married to the shadow anyways. But the former master doesn't even get to see the festivities for he's already been executed for being a shadow. Hans Christian Andersen, what was going on in your haunted to, brain? It sounds like to me like he like he's like, oh, there's people that aren't even real men and they're getting to marry yes. the princess when in reality uh, the real man is getting excommunicated for blessing a lot. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Dare I say it? Because I don't know Hans Andersen at all, obviously. Right. I don't know his life, his tale. We don't was have he incel? The te- is that what you're yes. thinking? I know. A like, lot of these things seem like incel, incel vibes. vibes. Yeah. Especially this next one. Have you heard the swine herd? No. Wait, is this where something is cast into the swine herd and then is killed? No. Oh, that's in the Bible. Oh, what's a swine herd? Just pigs? Just pigs. Okay. Yeah. No, that's different. I'm interested in that story. Yeah. Well, we talked about it sort of, but I did a bad job at it <laughs> when we talked about um, the Beast of Bray Road. Oh, Remember right. where there's like that guy who's a groundskeeper and then he like the word that the creature says to him is is something and Mm -hmm. it's a story about god casting evil into swines and then killing the swines right i remember yes Yes. okay it was like a small anecdote of an episode yes this is not that no time to explain great anecdote great episode so this one i feel like if you didn't think he was incel before this one like really like nails it if you don't know what incel is no time to google it yeah there was once a prince who wished to marry the emperor's daughter In the hopes of being able to meet her, he sends her two gifts. The first gift is a rose that only blooms once every five years, and it's so beautiful that anyone who smells it forgets all the sorrow and trouble in the world. Okay. The second gift is a nightingale that can sing all of the melodies in the world. The emperor emperor is so moved by the gifts that he weeps like a child, but his daughter throws them away in disgust she does what you do she's like you gave me a fucking nightingale that can sing anything i don't need this (laughs) no clutter in my life you gave me a rose that will make me forget all of my troubles and sorrows no no absolutely not she throws them away in disgust for neither are artificial Oh. The prince then disguises himself in rags and stains his face with dirt before seeking employment at the palace. He becomes the emperor's swine herd. In his dirty little hut, he creates a magical pot that the emperor's daughter takes a shine to, but he'll only sell it to her for 10 kisses. Eventually, her desire for the oh pot God. becomes so strong that she gives the grubby swineherd his kisses, and then she goes away happy with her pot. Next, the swineherd makes a magical musical rattle, but this he'll only sell for 100 kisses. The emperor's daughter lusts after the rattle and eventually gives the swineherd the kisses he desires. When the prince is 
taking his 86th kiss, the emperor discovers his daughter in the pigsty kissing a dirty swineherd. Disgusted, he beats them both over the head with his slipper and banishes them from his kingdom. As the emperor's daughter cries in the rain, the the swineherd goes behind a tree and washes the mud off his face. He throws away the rags and he changes into his princely garb before revealing himself to the dejected princess. He's so handsome that she falls to her knees before him, but he tells her that she he has come to despise her because she threw away the prince's beautiful gifts. But for a plaything, she kissed a swineherd. Disgusted, he goes inside and shuts the door in her face. <laughs> does that not sound just like the most incel thing you've ever read? Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> also, like tricking someone into giving you sexual attention Right. I think we could all agree is like universally bad. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I don't like I don't understand what is he saying there? Like he's mad that she didn't that yeah. she didn't like a bird or a rose because and it, it was she... going to die. What also what if she just didn't Oh, because it was going to die. Because it's not artificial. Uh, so I think I think there's I two ways to look at it. it to okay, I think there's two ways to look at it. I think what he's getting at is oh, she doesn't like these things that aren't of like significant value like okay you can you can't really like a a, a nightingale dies at one po- at like at some point mm. because it's a living breathing creature mm. and she only likes the artificial the jewels the right. the treasure the things that she can physically it's his, like like 1800s hold. way of like saying that she's like vapid yeah right right but also he's vapid because he thinks that um he's going to turn into a, like a, a lowly swine herder right by rubbing mud on his yeah, face yeah and like and then she's going to yeah like she's yeah. yeah like his morality is just not Skewed. yeah, yeah. He doesn't oh get but the now irony. i'm actually like a very beautiful prince and right. now i shut the door on your face like, right when what in are reality you it's about? like she actually was just being true to herself yeah. and she like kissed this guy because she wanted something from him which is fine yeah yeah. That's okay. Femin- yeah. Just because Feminism. it wasn't you, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He's just salty because it wasn't him. Also, maybe you should ask the girl that you want to get a gift for, hey, what are your interests? Right. I'm sorry. If somebody gave me a bird right now, I would be like, what am I supposed to do with this? I know. It'd be Great. Sad. Thank you for the bird. Now I have to keep it in a cage. I have to buy food for it. I got to learn all about how to take care of birds. This yeah. bird should be out flying or at the very least have a giant aviary where it can right. fuck other birds. I know. Like, don't give me this bird that now I have to learn how to be a bird handler. Yeah. Like he gave her a bird that can sing el- any melody and it's like, okay, great. Now I have this bird that's singing Justin Bieber, but like, what yeah. am I supposed to do with exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. Now I'm like responsible for this thing. Whereas if you just gave me a necklace, I would be like, cool, I'll wear this when I want to and put it away when I don't want to wear it. Right. You can't just put a bird away. I'm triggered. I am this triggered. This guy thinking that he's like so much better than this girl just because she wanted Oh, you're ungrateful for my a magical gift? pot. Sorry, but a magical pot sounds way better than a rose that yes. only blooms once every 500 years or whatever Yeah, I'm not even going to live that long. <laughs> Newsflash, this is the 1800s. I'm dying next week. Yeah. Like, thank you for this <laughs> useless fucking rose. Give me a magical pot where I can brew something that might keep me alive a little bit longer. Now, last one here, just because it's weird. It's called On the Last Day. Have you heard of this? No. Okay. As a man dies, he a man dies. That's how this the prelude to this. A man died. Okay. As the man follows death into the afterlife, he witnesses a bizarre masquerade of masked people. Some of the people are dressed in rags, and some in rich, uh, and some are dressed in riches. And peeping out from all of their garments are animals. The people are trying to pull apart each other's robes to reveal the shame that they hide beneath. Death explains that the masquerade is human life, and the shame beneath their clothes is the wild animal we all carry within us that struggles to get free. Okay. As they continue through the afterlife, hundreds of large black birds begin to follow the man, and they scream at him, Thou wanderer with death, rememberest thou me? They chase him, screaming relentlessly until the sound of it fills the whole world. And death tells the man that these birds are the evil thoughts and desires he had during his lifetime. As the man tries to escape the birds... 
the man realizes that he's slicing his bare feet on jagged stones that cover the ground for as far as his eyes can see, covering the earth like fallen leaves. Mm -hmm. He cries out in agony, and death tells him that the stones are every word the man ever uttered that wounded another person. Oh. Words which cut hearts deeper than the stones cut his feet. The man is eventually given mercy. He could not give the others in life, and he's allowed into heaven. Okay. Um, I think what I'm learning from all of these tales is that Hans Christian Andersen needed a good therapist. I know, right? Yeah, but it's hard because, okay, clearly the dude had some issues. Yeah. He had an unhealthy relationship with sex in one capacity or another. Some people even say that he might have been into young boys but we don't have any way to prove that okay so it could just be someone being made a rumor made a rumor or it could be real who knows yeah. but that could be representative of an animal within you that you feel guilty about you know yeah i mean i will say like because i'm sure someone in the comments is going to be like oh you can't make fun of him he was like dealing with a lot like blah blah okay but just because you're dealing with a lot doesn't excuse bad behavior and right. bad like bad that's the point of the story everyone must people. atone for the sins they've done true that's like the whole true this is the whole point of the story right like right. every bad word you've ever said about someone will cut your feet one day yeah and all of your bad things that you've done are gonna come and attack you true you know but i feel like his personality is like he's not looking at this from his own perspective i feel like I all know. of the stories seem like he's like someone owes me something right, someone know, treated do. me badly and it's like yeah no one owes you shit no, no one owes you shit that's life that's Sorry. life like look we've all been bullied we've all been bullied we've all been cheated on we've all been lied to but that doesn't mean that i suddenly all had four star reviews right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean that then i get to be like this super hot dude on the street needs to date me. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, right. That's not how that works. Like, guy doesn't owe me anything. I know, yeah, you can't go to someone's house and ask their sons to shave you. Yeah, just exactly. because of some past trauma you've had. Exactly. You know, yes. that's not fair. That's called trauma dumping. Oh wow. Yes. Okay. So maybe Charles Dickens was picking up on some of this the vibes weird sexual behavior. Right. Like the Danish were just like, oh, like fairy tales. We love that. Wow. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> and, and then the English guy was like, this guy's a fucking weirdo. Don't ever come to my house again. Don't. You're not allowed near my son in any capacity, let alone for him to shave you. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Didn't I Dickens write like the, the orphan thing? Great expectations. No. What's the one about the orphan? Oliver Twist? Could have been. I don't know could have been dickens on the strand i used to go when i was a child it was like this like theater extravaganza of all the dickens plays and it happened at oh, christmas fun. time in galveston Cute. texas probably everyone's dead that was performing then wow isn't that know. weird to think about what a trip <laughs> what a um, trip that people die what do you think of this episode um i think that hans christian anderson had some haunted shit rattling around in his brain he gave right. us a lot of bangers mm -hmm. and there were also a lot of misses so I think that's just that's life. I actually think about that in regards to this podcast sometimes because sometimes I'm like writing episodes and I'm like, this isn't a Mothman. Yeah. You know, this isn't a Boogeyman. This isn't, you know, the sleep paralysis episode. This isn't an, an MMI episode. This isn't like one of our like best ones. Yeah. But I think like even the best artists of all time have to have songs that aren't singles to fill up the album. Great. Right. Point. Great point. And as long as it's entertaining us. Then it has yeah. value. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As long as you guys are staying on your schedules, you're listening to this on your way to your capitalist agenda on Wednesday morning, <laughs> then we're all continuing to just be cogs in the machine. You know what? I drive a lot for my job and I listen to a ton of podcasts. I listen to a ton of podcasts. And so sometimes even like the shittiest of podcasts, I'm like, right. well, I'm going to listen to this because it fills up the time. time and it makes the drive faster i know so, i listen to some yeah. really bad podcasts yeah so even <laughs> when you're listening to a miss and not a banger right it's, you're, it's getting the job done all we can hope is that we're just someone's bad podcast to pass the time while they're like i would not be even so honored attention. yeah i yeah. would be so honored while they're just like dazed off thinking about what they're gonna eat and our voices are in the background they can't even make out what they're saying what right. we're saying right <laughs> but i actually i do really like this episode because i had not heard a lot of those fairy tales they seem very haunted mm -hmm. and while it's not like a real story that happened in real life it's coming from a man 
who is writing down about like his experiences and agendas that he wants to transmit to the masses and that's haunted and i also think it's very it's a good point it's very inspirational is the last thing i'll say about this because he was a man who like really against all odds everyone's saying you're weird everyone's saying you're yeah. ugly everyone's saying you're never going to be anything you're poor you're this and he actually defied all of those odds by staying true to himself even though everyone was like you know even the critics were saying he was bad he just continued doing what he thought was making him happy which was plus signs good you know what we've all got a plus sign from time to time right i want instead of a nut button a plus button yes plus and it's in his old timey <laughs> plus danish voice yeah <laughs> yeah Love it. if you're danish and uh you know the word for plus or like a good a good equivalent um, equivalent of that let us let us know yeah send us a sound bite to let's get haunted pod at gmail.com yeah we would love that yeah we would i would love that absolutely well Allie, do you want to do our sign off for this episode yes i would love to great episode natalia thank you um brb gotta go get stuck in a weather balloon <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye.